In 1962, a little-known Japanese peace activist and author named Daisaku Ikeda made his first visit to the country of Turkey during a tour of the Middle East and Europe. The purpose of his trip was simple. He wanted to make friends with people from cultures other than his own and take even a small step toward breaking down the barriers that existed between East and West. Ten years later, Ikeda became friends with renowned British historian Arnold Toynbee, who invited him to come to England to exchange ideas on the subject of peace. Toynbee, whom Time magazine called an international sage like Einstein and Schweitzer, had also visited Turkey many years earlier, at a time when Turks and Muslims were vilified across Europe. Toynbee had dared to challenge this widely accepted bigotry, and he shared with Ikeda how his journey to Turkey became a turning point in his life. In an essay he wrote in the wake of 9-11, entitled, Another Way of Seeing Things, Daisaku Ikeda recounts Professor Toynbee's experience in Turkey while reflecting on its relevance to the current challenges facing humanity. I have long felt that Turkey, as a country pivotally linking East and West, North and South, has a unique role to play in promoting peace and understanding. Turkey embraces both Asia and Europe. In 1992, on my first visit to Turkey in 30 years, I found myself in Istanbul, gazing at the Bosporus Strait. The land on the west side of the narrow channel is Europe. On the east side is Asia. Travelers from the west encounter the cultural richness of the east. And those from the east encounter the technology and innovation of the west. To both, the world begins to show a new and different face. <laughs> Turkey is the land of the poet Homer's birth. It was crossed by the conquering Alexander the Great. Classical Greek civilization once flourished here. During the Byzantine Empire, it was the leading center of the Christian world. And later, under the Ottoman Turks, it was the heart of Islamic civilization. Mirroring its kaleidoscopic history, Turkey today is a place of immense human diversity. In towns and cities, you can see people with Arab and Mongolian features. People with faces reminiscent of Greek statues, Russian faces, East European faces. It's as if the land of Turkey is trying to encompass and unite all humanity. Calling out, West, you may be East in my embrace. East, you may be west in my home.
I have fond memories of the historian Arnold Toynbee. Over the course of two years, Dr. Toynbee and I engaged in an exchange of views that lasted a total of 10 days. For Toynbee, Turkey had a special significance because it was events he witnessed there that propelled him to become a pioneer in looking beyond the Eurocentric view of history. During our conversations in his London apartment, he told me that he once lost his job at London University because he had angered people prejudiced against Turks with his straightforward reporting of events in Turkey. Toynbee visited Turkey in 1921 when he was about 32 years old. He had gone to observe the Greco-Turkish war that had been raging for two years. Turkey, 1921. Great troops battle Turkish nationalists in the land of the harem and the fez. Greek forces move deep into Turkey while claiming Anatolia for Greece. But the nationalists fight back to push out the invading Greeks and to save the sick man of Europe. Toynbee first observed conditions from the Greek side, then from the Turkish. For Toynbee, who believed in St. Augustine's injunction, hear the other side, this was absolutely crucial. And he placed particular importance on listening to the side that was the more in danger of not being given a fair hearing. The Greeks had the ear of the West, and the West was in the ascendant in the world. I was familiar with the Greeks' case. I felt it could take care of itself. The Turks' case was the one I must take pains to understand. Toynbee traveled to a town where Turkish civilians had been massacred. He witnessed the suffering of Turkish refugees and was outraged that these atrocities went completely unreported in the West. Writing down the facts exactly as he'd seen them, he wired his reports to the Manchester Guardian, a leading British newspaper. The editor of the paper courageously published the full contents of Toynbee's reports. But journalistic integrity would come at a price. For centuries, the Turks had been portrayed in the West as uncivilized savages. Making matters worse, the horrors of the 1915 Armenian massacre carried out by the Ottoman Turks were still fresh in people's minds. So, not surprisingly, when Toynbee's articles appeared, the newspaper was besieged by a storm of criticism. 
people attacked it for shamelessly publishing articles sympathetic to the unspeakable Turk. But the paper's courageous stance of refusing to bend to what Toynbee saw as prejudice against Muslims shines to this day. At the other end of the spectrum, the article made a deep impression on the Turks. They were astonished that a young Englishman had visited a Turkish refugee camp. That he'd impartially recorded what he saw, and that a British newspaper had actually published it. It was the first time their side of the story had been conveyed to the world. Years later, Toynbee described how Turkish people had gathered around the newspaper, their faces flushed with excitement as they read his article. Relying only on information from the West, viewing things always from the Western perspective does not provide a true picture of the world. There is an African view of the world, a world seen from the Middle East, from Latin America, through the eyes of various ethnic minorities. There's more to international society than just the West. On his homeward journey from Istanbul, Toynbee began to outline what would become his life work, a study of history. From these early thoughts, he later developed the groundbreaking historical perspective that was his great gift to humanity. Shortly after his return to Britain, Toynbee was forced to resign from London University over what was seen as his support for the Turks. The young Toynbee knew it was wrong to stereotype and thus dehumanize people, as the Turks had been. He felt the important thing is to get to know individuals. So he put his conviction into practice, making friends with Turkish people and learning their language. Toynbee wrote, when one becomes personally acquainted with a fellow human being, of whatever religion, nationality, or race, one cannot fail to recognize that he is human, like oneself. Has the danger of stereotyping people lessened since the days of Dr. Toynbee's youth? I don't believe so. That gentleman with the beard, he's the one I'm looking for. I want to rewind and I want you to bring him back. Yeah, that's him. All right, now rewind, reset that shot, and we'll do a free frame right at the end. Stand by. In fact, what might be called the tyranny of images, the propagation of stereotypes and ready made images, may have even increased. One billion Muslims worldwide. How many are potential terrorists? Tonight, a special report The Face of Islam. Much of the information that floods our world has been selected and tailored to fit preconceived notions and stereotypes. In the extremity of wartime, repeatedly airing scenes of our side coming under attack will incite and enrage viewers. In contrast, scenes of the hellish misery inflicted on the other country's citizens will rarely be broadcast. Frustrated local authorities are asking the notion of jihad. The growth and development of mass media 
has actually increased the danger of proliferating stereotypes and ready-made images. You don't have to be a history Islamic fan. fundamentalism and terror. We are all exposed to these risks. At 10 o'clock for our special report. Do Islamic clerics use the pulpit to stir up hatred? Against it's vital that we each ask ourselves some important questions. With tensions simmering in the region, experts say it's not... Do I accept without question the images shown to me? The mercy killers. Do I believe unconfirmed reports without first examining them? Have I unwittingly allowed myself to become prejudiced? Do I really have a grasp of the facts of the matter? Have I confirmed these things for myself? Have I gone to the scene? Have I met the people involved? Have I listened to what they have to say? Am I being swayed by malicious rumors? I believe that this kind of inner dialogue is crucial. That's because people who are aware they may harbor unconscious prejudices can interact with people of other cultures more easily than those who are convinced they have no prejudices. When we stop looking at ourselves, when we no longer question ourselves, we become self-righteous and dogmatic. Our interactions then become a one-way street we cannot hear others, and real dialogue becomes impossible. The kind of dialogue that can create peace with others must start with an open and earnest inner dialogue. If we think about it, people are not born Turks or Americans. They're not born Palestinians or Jews. These are merely labels. Each of us is born as a precious entity of life, as a human being. Our mothers didn't give birth to us thinking, I'm giving birth to a Japanese, or I'm giving birth to an Arab. Their only thought was, may this child be healthy and grow. Perhaps the clouds and wind high above the blue waters of the Bosporus are whispering among themselves as they gaze down upon humanity. Wake up. From up here it's clear that the world is one. You are all citizens of the earth. There is no such thing as Americans, no such thing as Iraqis. There's only this boy, this life, called Bob, who happens to live in America. There's only this boy, this life, Mohammed, who happens to live in Iraq. Both are children of the earth. And yet they're divided by the names of their countries and taught to hate each other. Wake up from this foolishness, this arrogance, this cruel habit of passing hatred and resentment on to the next generation. We need to awaken to a common consciousness that we are all inhabitants of Earth. This awareness will not be found in some distant place. It won't be found on a computer screen. It lies in our hearts. in our ability to share the pain of our fellow human beings. It's the spirit that says, as long as you are suffering, whoever you are and whatever your suffering may be, I suffer too.